Today, what I want to do is look at a phrase that is often given and used when somebody is trying to comfort another. Maybe somebody's going through a difficult or challenging experience, and they just want to be a good friend and give them a word of advice to help them through that season. As I look around the room, I'm confident that if not everyone, then just about everyone in this room has experienced a difficult experience in your life. For some of you, that may be losing a loved one. For others of you, this may be losing a a job, maybe losing a relationship. For some of you, it could be a a financial struggle or maybe a challenge with your kids. Maybe your kids are just in a rebellious season. The reality is we've all gone through some really challenging experiences. And perhaps you are in the midst of one of those experiences when a good friend of yours, a, a friend who believes in God and just wanted to encourage you, sat you down and said, hey, I just want you to know that God won't give you more than you can handle. Now, if you've ever experienced that, I want you to think about how you reacted or what you thought in that moment. Now, I had a unique opportunity this week. My wife was going through a challenging day with our two-and-a-half-year-old. He was just giving her a hard time, and she actually came into the room where I was working on this very message, and she came into the room, and she looked at me, and I could just tell she was done. Parents with toddlers, you know this feeling. She is just done, and she tells me. She looks me in the eyes, and she says, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm just done right now. And in that moment, a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, what a perfect opportunity to test my theory for the message this morning. And so my wife said those words, and I looked at her, and I said, sweetie, don't you know that God won't give you more than you can handle? And my wife looked at me with the scariest, meanest, death glare that tiny woman could muster up and peered into my soul and I realized in the moment yeah my theory is right that's not a good response ever to give and I thought to myself well you know at least it'll make a pretty good sermon illustration although I'm pretty sure I just ruined any chance I had for tonight hey don't ever say I've never given anything up for you guys just saying good thing my wife's not in here right now Maybe you've been in a situation like that and you hear that piece of advice. Maybe you hear another piece of advice. You're just going through a difficult time and somebody tells you, well, you know God helps those who help themselves. So why don't you just pull your bootstraps up, get get in the game and start doing something. Maybe somebody came to you and said, well, don't you know everything happens for a reason? God closes a door and he opens a window. And you are ready to throat punch every Christian that walks into your proximity over the next 24 hours. We've been there. Here's the truth. The truth is your friends really do just want to help. The problem is we've often been told some things that aren't very helpful, some things that aren't actually even biblical. This phrase that God won't give you more than you can handle just isn't true. People go through things that they can't handle all the time. You know this. You've been there yourselves which is also why some people will look for something to help them cope with the situation that they're in. They'll look for something to help them deal with the pain. For some people, they turn to alcohol. And because they're experiencing more than they can handle, they just want to drown their sorrows and forget about their problems. Other people will turn to drugs. Some people turn to pornography. Others will turn to illicit relationships. Some people, just to kind of forget about everything else, will just start getting on television and just binging for hours and hours. Some people do that with food. They just start binge eating to kind of, in the South, they called it comfort food to help you forget the pain. There's all kinds of things we do. Some people just check out emotionally. Yeah, they're there physically, but they're not really there. People experience things they cannot handle all the time. So where does this phrase come from? This phrase that God won't give you more than you can handle, where is that found? Well, actually, I think it is simply a bad paraphrase of one single verse in the Bible. If you got your Bibles with you, we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I wanna read it to you in two different translations this morning. It's gonna be on the screens and it's in your handouts that you received when you came in. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 in the ESV translation 
It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Let me read it to you again in the NIV translation. It's very similar, but it's got a few different nuances that are different. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So here's my question. What is being referred to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13? It's temptation, is it not? What Paul is saying is that when temptation comes your way, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear because he's going to provide a way of escape for you. In the context of this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul's specifically referring to things like the temptation of idolatry, which is worshiping something other than God, sexual immorality, the temptation to, to grumble and accuse God for things not going the way that you want them to. He said these temptations are not uncommon. We all face these kind of things. In fact, according to Hebrews chapter 4, there is no temptation that you are facing right now that Jesus did not also face and successfully overcome. What Paul does is in this beautiful verse is he gives us a promise about the character of God. He tells us that God is faithful and that he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. You may be thinking, oh, see, Joe, there it is. It's right there. God won't give you more than you can handle. No, that's not actually what it's saying. It's saying that God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear because when you're tempted, God will always provide a way of escape. Notice that the way of escape isn't provided by you just hunkering down and pushing through the temptation. Being able to bear it isn't even about your strength. It's about God making a way for you. You guys see this? The truth is, God will allow you to go through more than you can handle. And the Bible is full of examples. And I could tell you story after story of this taking place, but what I wanna do is actually point you to Jesus. Now, Jesus was fully God, so there was nothing he couldn't handle, but he was also fully man. And in his time on earth, he lived in his humanity so that he could provide a perfect example for us. So the life that Jesus lived is actually a model for us to live as well. And what I love is that when Jesus faces one of the most difficult, distressing moments of his life is he shows us what we're to do when we go through things that we cannot handle in our own strength as well. If you would, look with me to Mark chapter 14. I'm gonna start in verse 33. And just to explain what's going on here, this is the night that Jesus is betrayed into the hands of the religious leaders right before he's crucified. And so Jesus knows that this is coming. It's the last time that he's gonna spend with his disciples. And so he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Here's what it says, Mark chapter 14, verse 33. It says that he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Can you imagine that Jesus himself was so sorrowful, even to the point of death? He was greatly distressed and troubled. It says, verse 35, and going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. I love Jesus' response. In the moment of his greatest distress, what did he do? He prayed. He drew near to his father. He asked God to move, and he specifically said in verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. I mean, think about the distress of Jesus' soul that he would ask God to remove what he was about to go through. Jesus knew what was about to take place. Here's the crazy thing. The worst part about it wasn't being nailed to a cross and left to die and suffocate. 
That wasn't the worst part about it. The worst part about it was that Jesus was going to receive the wrath of God for the sins of every single one of us in this room. Every single person across history and into the future. Jesus was about to bear the full wrath of God on our behalf. That was the most distressing part for him. He said, God, if it's possible, Father, if it is possible, would you remove this cup from me? Yet I love his final line. He said, yet not what I will, but what you will. Father, I know that this is part of your plan. And as hard as it is, not what I will, but what you will. Whatever you want, that's what I want. God will allow you to go through more, you, go through more than you can handle. The important question for me is why? Why would he allow us to go through these things? Well, I think there's at least two biblical reasons that God will allow you to go through more than you can handle. And I want to share those with you this morning. If you're taking notes, the first one is this. So that you will depend on his presence. Let me say that one more time. So that you will depend on his presence. How many of you know that when things are good, people tend to forget about God? Like when things are going well in your life, you don't really feel a great need for God. When the job is going well, when you're getting that promotion, when business is taking off, when you're getting the good grades, you're kind of, things are just kind of happening. Yeah, maybe you may think about God, but you don't really feel your need for God. But when things start to go south, when things get hard, people look for help. My brother, after years of running from God, not wanting anything to do with him, finally opened up to the possibility of God moving in his life when he hit rock bottom. And it took him coming to that place, sitting in a jail cell, to finally open up and say, okay, God, maybe you are real. And if you are, I could sure use your help. And it was through that moment and that experience getting to the bottom point of his life up until that point that he began to be open to God working in his life. And eventually, a few months later, it led to him becoming a follower of Jesus and it radically transforming his life. After 12 years, 12 years of praying and crying out for God to move in his life, it took that difficulty to open his eyes to the reality of the situation. Do you guys see this? In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, I want to share a story with you when Paul himself experienced something that was more than he could handle. He's writing this letter to the churches in Corinth and wants to fill them in on some experiences that they were going through. And he said in verse 8, he said, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Does that sound like Paul was experiencing more than he could handle? I think so. Paul and his companions were so overwhelmed that they just assumed that they were going to die. They felt like it was all over and there was nothing they could do. They had done everything in their own power. Now they were stuck. There's nothing they could do. Therefore, they did the only thing that was left. The only thing that they could do. Keep reading verse nine. He said, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us, watch this, to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Do you see this? Paul and his companions were going through something so difficult that they, they just assumed it's over. Our life is over. We're going to die here. But you know what? We have a God who brings dead things back to life. So the only thing that we can do in this moment is to completely rely on him and to trust in him. In fact, he said, God brought us through that, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. Why does God allow us to go through things that are more than we can handle. So we learn to depend on his presence. 
Friends, God doesn't want you to rally your own strength. He wants you to rely on his strength in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, the very next verse, Paul says, he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. See, what happening, what's happening is that Paul's facing another difficulty. He's facing another hopeless situation But having just recently experienced a divine deliverance through God in his recent past, Paul was now confident that God would act on his behalf again. He had just learned an important lesson about God's goodness and faithfulness in the midst of pain, in the midst of difficulty. And what it did was it gave him a fresh perspective on his current pain and difficulty. See, Paul didn't focus on his current peril he focused on his present deliverer do you see this listen I don't know what you're going through this morning I don't know what you're going to face in the weeks months and years to come but if you need grace if you need strength if you need courage to press through a situation that is greater than you can handle, I want to encourage you to do what Paul did and to begin to shift your focus. To shift your focus from your difficulty to your deliverer. To shift your focus from your challenge to his character. Because God is good. And he is faithful. And he is powerful. And he is full of grace and full of mercy. And he is a capable deliverer to deliver you from the situation that you are facing right now. Do you believe that this morning? We need to shift our focus. I remember a particular season of my life that I would describe as the dark night of my soul, the dark night of the soul. Never heard that phrase before. It's that moment that you go through where it feels like everything's falling apart. It's one of the most difficult seasons of your life where, you, where it just feels like nothing's going well. For me, it felt like God was absent. It felt like God had, had left me. It was literally a season in my life that I was going through that, that stirred up doubts about God's goodness. It stirred up doubts in my heart about his love for me. At some points, it even stirred up doubts about his existence. And here I was, Joe, Bible school graduate with a degree in biblical studies, teaching young kids about how God loves them, doubting whether or not he loved me. It was one of those dark nights of the soul. And and in that season, even though it was a difficult season, I never stopped doing my devotional time. It's just something that's been ingrained in me for a long time, something I've developed and So I was still reading my Bible every morning, but it just seemed like God wasn't there. (laughs) Like he wasn't listening, he wasn't talking. But I came across a chapter in the book of Lamentations. I just happened to be reading through the book of Lamentations and came to Lamentations chapter three. And I began to read this and it kind of described my feelings exactly. I think for some of you this morning, it may describe how you feel right now. I wanna read it to you. Lamentations chapter three, verse 17 says, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. Anybody ever been there before? So I say my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. And I was reading those verses and was thinking, that's me. That's where I am. Like, I don't even remember what it was to be happy. It's been that long. It's been that hard. And then I read the next verses, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 27. And I actually ended up taking verses 22 through 27 and writing them on a note card, putting them up on my bathroom mirror because it just gave me a new hope that I had lost. Gave me a fresh perspective that I had lost sight of and I put it on my bathroom mirror I ended up memorizing it in that season of my life and I would remind myself of it every morning and then every time I was discouraged every time I had a doubt every time I felt defeated I would remind myself of this Lamentations chapter 3 verse 21 through 27 says but this I call to mind therefore I have hope you ready 
The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who seek him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. In verse 27, this doesn't apply to at least half the room, but I was a young man at the time, so it applied to me, and I wrote this one down too. It says, it is good that a man should bear the yoke in his youth. Can I just remind you this morning? God's love is steadfast. His mercy knows no end. You can have fresh grace and mercy every single morning. He is a faithful God. I don't know what it is that you're going through today, but I want to remind you that God sees you, that he loves you, that he has not forsaken you, that there is hope in him, hope in his character. That was one of the most difficult seasons of my life. But as I sought God in that season, he met me in some of the most significant ways of my life. And while I would never want to go through that season again, ever, I wouldn't trade it for the world either. Because in that season, God met with me and God shaped me and he molded me and he taught me some things that laid a foundation for who I am today. You know, sometimes in life, we're on the mountaintops where it feels like everything is going our way. And at other times, we're in the valley when it seems like everything is falling apart. I learned that I would much rather be in a valley with Jesus than on a mountaintop by myself. Now, if I'm being honest, I'd probably rather be on a mountaintop with Jesus. <laughs> but there is a level of closeness with God that you can only experience in that season in the valley. There's a nearness to him that is found in that place. God will allow us to go through more than we can handle so that we can learn to depend and rely on his presence to carry us through. Second reason I think that God will allow you to go through more than you can handle is so that you can experience his power. If you're taking notes, I'm gonna say that one more time. You have a chance to write it down. So that you can experience his power. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven and eight, Paul's talking about experience that he's going through. He said, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, revelations that God had given him, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Paul said, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Three times I cried out to God. Three times I said, God, would you please take this thing away? Now, we don't exactly know what it was that this thorn represented. We don't know what the thorn was exactly. Different scholars and, uh, and commentators have different theories. Some people say, well, it could have been like a spiritual thing, a spiritual affliction or a mental affliction. Other people say it could be some persecution. The one that I tend to agree with, I don't know for sure, but it seems like it might have actually been a physical issue that he was going through. You read Galatians chapter four, it said Paul had an issue with his eyes, his eyesight, and it was a physical health issue that delayed him in the city of Galatia. So some people think it could be this issue with his eyes that he just kept dealing with and dealing with that, that hindered him. We don't know what it is. We're not sure. Here's what we do know. When Paul asked God to take it away, instead of removing it, here's what he said to him. He said in verse nine, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my, what? My power. Let's say that together. For my, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses. Can you believe that? Can you imagine coming to a place where you are content with weaknesses and insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities? Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. In our weakness, God can display his power. You know, if you look throughout the Bible, you see this over and over again. Moses, for example, God used to lead the people of Israel out of slavery and to this land that God had promised them. The only thing is when, when, Mo, when God called Moses, Moses started pushing back. He said, no, God, I can't be the one that you use. I, I can't talk well. I got a stutter. Like, don't use me. I, I'm not capable. And he just began to make up all of these excuses for why God couldn't use him. But God chose him on purpose. And what I love about it is that Moses' weaknesses gave room for God's power to be put on display. So when we go through and reread the Old Testament, we read the book of Exodus, we don't talk about how great Moses was. We talk about how great God was and how we used a flawed human to fulfill his purposes. Do you see this? Our weaknesses make room for God's power to be on display. There was a guy in the Old Testament named Gideon. In the book of Judges, it talks about this guy and it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm calling you to go and deliver my people from the hand of the Midianites. A group of people that had come in and oppressed the Israelites. They basically made the Israelites their slaves. And, and Gideon said, who am I? He said, I am the least of my father's house and my father's house is the least clan of the tribe. And Who am I that you would come to me? I, I can't be the guy. Angel Lord said, no, but I've chosen you. God has called you. And so Gideon received the call and he gathered up an army of just over 20,000 soldiers to come against the Midianites. God looked at him and said, you got too many guys. I don't want you to take any kind of credit. He didn't say this exactly, but I don't want you to take any kind of credit for the deliverance that I'm about to bring through you. So God whittled that army down from 22,000 to 300 people. By the way, the army they were fighting was over 100,000 men. 300 men against over 100,000. And God worked in that situation and he delivered the Israelites. They overthrew the Midianites. It said that over 120,000 men were killed in that battle. There were 300 men. How many of you know that it is not possible for an army of 300 to overthrow over 100,000 in that day and age. They didn't have heavy artillery. They didn't have aircraft dropping bombs. No, no, it was just men with swords. It was the power of God on display. You guys see this? Our weaknesses are actually opportunities to experience God's power at work in our lives. When he calls you to do something bigger than you thought possible, there will be more than you can handle. If you're gonna have kids, parents, there will be more than you can handle. If you're gonna be a foster parent, there will be more than you can handle. If you're gonna be married to a military spouse, there will be more than you can handle. If you are a man married to a woman, (laughs) or you're a woman married to a man, there will be more than you can handle. And God will allow you to go through more than you can handle so that his great power might be displayed in your life. I heard a, actually many of my mentors have said this in the past. They, they said we are either in a storm, just coming out of a storm, or getting ready to get into a storm. Pretty encouraging, isn't it? Yeah, some de- depressing advice. <laughs> but it's true. Some of you right now are in a storm. You're going through that dark night of the soul. You're experiencing that challenge. Some of you just came out of it. You feel like you can breathe finally. It's been so long. Some of you are getting ready to go into it. I wanna encourage you with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He said, come to me all you who are weary 
and burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. When you're faced with more than you can handle, I want to encourage you to hand it over to God. Don't allow the presence of a storm to cause you to doubt the presence of God. So will God allow you to go through more than you can handle? Yes, he will. The most important thing is what we do when we are in those experiences. God wants us to depend on him. He he wants us to experience his power. We just have to bring our challenges to him. We just gotta let him get in on what it is that we're going through. Because if we will rely on God, he will supply you with all the grace that you need for every situation that you face. Let me pray for you this morning. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. And Lord, you know every challenge that they are facing. Lord, you know every difficulty that they are in. Lord, you know every painful season they've gone through. God, I thank you that in the midst of our darkest night, you were there. God, I thank you that your steadfast love never ceases that your mercies never come to an end, but they're new every morning. God, I pray right now for every person that is in that season, that is going through that challenge, Lord, I pray that you would give them a hope for the future, a hope for resolution, a hope for restoration and redemption, a hope for a new day. God, would you fill them with a hope that can only come from you, Would you help us to depend on your presence? God, we want to experience your power at work in our lives. In the name of Jesus. If you'd do me a favor and just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a little while longer.